What's up, friends? Today, it is my honor to introduce you to such an incredible person. He's a personal mentor. He is an author, an entrepreneur extraordinaire, international speaker, and not just a leader in network marketing, but the like top earner in network marketing. He's up there. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but he's like in top five, easy. Justin Prince has built four different multi-million dollar businesses, generating over $2 billion in total revenue. He trains people all over the world in all walks of life. He has shared the stage with many incredible people, including John Maxwell. He has so much value to offer. And I have the honor to work with him, but everyone can learn from him. So I ask that you go and follow him in all the places. He will inspire you as a parent, as an entrepreneur, in any level of your life. And I cannot wait for you to get to hear from him today. Thank you for joining me. Let's go level after next. Justin friends, I am so excited to have you on the show. This has been something I've thought about for so long. I'm honored to get to share you with my audience. My palms are sweaty, like really sweaty right now. <laughs> oh, man, I'm honored to be on. I, I uh, always enjoy our time, you know, that I get with you and, and uh, just love your vibe and energy and the, you know, the, the goodness you put out in the world. And I'm excited to be able to to meet your people and, you know, and, and have this conversation with you. It is about time that they get to meet you. You are, your last name is Prince. You're more like the king of network marketing. <laughs> You've been around the block a few times. And I know that when it comes to network marketing, obviously there's a lot of, there's a lot of flack that people get in network marketing. There's a lot of people who try to succeed for a long time. I know that you had such a journey coming up through network marketing then coming out of network marketing, you're back in it and you are at the top. So I would just love to kind of go back and if you could share what that journey was like for you. Yeah. So it was, it was a journey for sure. And, you know, um, I look back now as much as I didn't love <laughs> parts of the journey it was super hard, you know, like, you know, when you're failing and it's just not going anywhere and you're wondering if you're crazy. Uh, I look back now and it's given me a lot of empathy. You know, I feel like I can relate to people and kind of where they're at and where they're coming from. But, you know, I, I grew up in kind of a middle class family. My folks got divorced when I was 12. We moved 13 times in the seven years from from those kind of teenage years. Uh, I was raised by single parents, but I lived at my single mom's house. And so I have a special place in my heart for single moms, for sure. I was her oldest and uh, have really no professional background. I was making pizzas and doing like kind of mindless construction work. And then I worked at a mall kiosk and I tease people that the malls were all of us older people used to go and the Amazon was a river. And some of <laughs> your audience remember those days, but uh, I worked at the kiosk in the mall. I sold Bible videos, like animated Bible videos at the, at the mall kiosk. And I have no college education. My wife and I, uh, we got married when I was 22. We had a, our little baby uh, 13 months later when I was 23. And just kind of had life coming at me fast. And so I, uh, it, I always had big dreams and big goals, always kind of wanted to do something with my life. And when I was 25, I was introduced to the network marketing kind of idea. You know, it's interesting. I think oftentimes people are down on what they're not up on. I didn't know anything about network marketing, but I didn't want to know anything else. I was just kind of skeptical about it for whatever reason. And I look back now and I'm like, why was I so skeptical? I had really no reason to be. And uh, I kind of got past my biases and skepticisms and so on. And I kind of fell in love with the whole idea that you could work for three or four or five years of your life. You could build an income stream that potentially could follow you for decades. You could travel around and help people, serve people. In my case, talk about nutrition and wellness. You know, you're building this, like, there's really no risk to the business, meaning from a financial or credit perspective, most businesses, you're either your credit's on the line, your cash is on the line, or a combination of both. And network marketing was really kind of just more of a sweat equity type model, but you could still build the the economic upside of a of a big traditional business. So I was just like, I'm in, you know, let's do this thing. So long story short, I, I became the number three earner and the national spokesperson for this little nutrition company. And I was like traveling around the country and things are going, you know, like we're kind of on the way up. And then the company itself went out of business. The company uh, had been through a whole bunch of different internal issues. And so they went out of business when that happened literally overnight, no kidding. One night we were in business the next day we weren't. And I, so I, I lost everything and it hit me at a really kind of precarious financial situation where I had taken some steps backwards in my job to like 
you know, kind of like two steps back to take 10 steps forward, but I hadn't taken any of the steps forward yet. And so I was in a really tough financial situation. I was below zero financially, back on credit cards, back on taxes. Um, and it was kind of a, a, a tough time. So at one point we, we moved from the, where we were living into the loft of my wife's parents' garage. I, we had two little babies. My wife is pregnant with our third child. We have two little babies. So uh, our two kids slept in the closet. <laughs> my wife and I are in this little loft. I thought it'd be like a week or two or three or something. It was the whole pregnancy is it 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 basically eight months because we moved in a couple weeks into the pregnancy. This woman is a saint. <laughs> yeah, it was not. It was not. But my wife would get. Uh, we had. We had during those that season. Those seasons of building our business, we had six pregnancies and four babies. So we had a, a miscarriage and then a stillborn birth. And my wife was super sick with all six, meaning. She had kind of the morning sickness thing, but it just never went away. And so it was just that whole season was like a blur. She was four for four in C-sections. It was just like a total blur that whole season. And um, during that time, I, I'm working two part-time jobs and trying to chase the dream of being free in network marketing. I started with another business. And, you know, there was many times I'd lay at night in my bed and it's like one in the morning and I'm like pitch black. And I go, are you awake? <laughs> and she goes, yeah. She goes, are you awake? I go, Yeah. I'm like, am I crazy? Like, am I chasing a fake dream? Like, is this ever going to happen for us? And I think a lot of people know that feeling of like, I know that other people are successful in this whole thing, but am I, am I, am I ever going to be successful? You know? And I just kept kind of grinding and kept moving forward. And long story short, I became the fastest growing insurer we had anywhere in the United States with that company. I was traveling all over the, the world with that company. I was 29, I was speaking in Moscow and Umsk, Russia and Amadi, Kazakhstan, come through the former Soviet Union. And I ended up selling that business. So what happened for me, Katie, is I got to a point, it's the best way I can describe it. It's almost like I climbed the mountain, you know, the mountain of success, if, you know, in network marketing. And I looked down and I liked the view. The view was pretty, but it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It like wasn't what I was told it was going to look like. And so I couldn't in good conscience look back down the mountain and tell everyone that was struggling to come back up like, you can do it. Don't quit. You know, you got this because I felt like, I felt like the business model of network marketing was kind of fundamentally stacked against the normal person winning. And so I just remember thinking, I was like, man, I, I just can't, you know, I can't do this anymore. So I ended up selling that business and I never thought I would do network marketing again. I was out for two years. Uh, I was doing private equity consul consulting. And then my current, my current business uh, was a company that was 25 years old, but it had eight years of declining revenue. So I came in originally as a consultant to this kind of uh, 25 year old business. And we were part of a transformation team to see if we could like transform this company. And so in that process, we built our current business. And the first, the first about, I would call it four years, maybe five years, we, we were growing, but it was like incremental growth. It was just like two steps forward, one step back, one step forward, two steps back. It was just like, we'd like kind of go up, kind of go down, kind of go up, kind of go down. And then finally we kind of caught a gear in, uh, you know, really 2017, 18, 19, and then just, you know, 2020 and, and beyond. And it's, it's turned into an incredible business. We've, you know, our team's acquired over 4 million customers. We've done over like 2.4 billion in revenue and just turned into an incredible, incredible ride, you know? And I feel like we're just getting, <laughs> just getting that party started and kind of what we're going to do and where we're going to go. So that's a, that's a quick catch up of kind of my journey in the profession. I love it. So you kind of, when you came into this company to help turn it around, essentially, it has a checkered past <laughs> and, um, the idea, sorry, Betsy the dog is required so to be a part of it. this. She's like, what? Justin Prince is here? Um, I would love for you to explain because really what you wanted to do was something new, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this idea of changing the way that network marketing is done, essentially, how did it come about and how is it different? Yeah, so you you kind of have to understand the traditional business model to, to kind of understand the differences. So um, in the traditional network marketing business model, most of the revenue comes from distributors. Now, as a distributor, we'd say, that's not true. I have a lot of customers on my team, but a lot of times our customers are people that like, they like join to get the discount, basically. Like they join to like be there. So they're technically a rep. They're technically a consultant or distributor, but they, we know their customers. The company knows their customers. They know their customers, but like a federal agency would look at them as a distributor because they, they, they signed up to get the discount. And so most of our revenue comes from people that are consuming the products that are part of the team, basically, you know, they're like distributors, part of the team. So in fact, the model typically was like, you know, you recruit recruiters to recruit recruiters to recruit recruiters, and then you're, it's a consumption model. So you're paid an override on all of the, 
the consumption of that team. So what kind of happened for us is, well, so here's the challenges with that. If you can't recruit people, you don't make money. And 70% of network marketers recruit zero people. So 70% of the people that come in make no money. And that sucks. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where you're like, you're like, you got this team. And the truth is they're not going to succeed. And so I'm not, by the way, I'm not talking about the ones that come in and do nothing. But those ones don't give me a ton of heartburn, people that come in and do zero. The ones that give me a lot of heartburn and used to keep me up at night was the ones that came in, did what they were supposed to do, showed up did the personal development, worked hard, built their skill sets, and it still wasn't working. Those, those are painful. And I felt like a lot of that was a model issue. Like, so when you think of a model, think of like Blockbuster and Netflix. What, what Netflix did originally was not new entertainment. It was like you could get Terminator 2 at Blockbuster, you could get it at Netflix. So it wasn't new entertainment. It was a better distribution model. It was a better way to get access to the entertainment. Now, since then, they have what they call original entertainment. Like they created their own content. But originally, that wasn't the plan. The plan was just, you know, they just, it was just a better way to do it. And so any model, you know, Uber created a better way to, to experience a city. Any model that creates a better way to do what you were already doing can disrupt the old models. In fact, you look back at him and you're like, why did we used to do it that way? That was so, you know, God, that was dumb. And so what was happening, particularly 10 years ago when I first started this project, was the shift from, from physical to, to digital. So from like physical stores to online, you know, e-commerce retail. And I remember thinking, again, if we can get ahead of the shift, we're going we're gonna to crush. Because there was companies like a guilt.com or One King's Lane or Fab or Zululi. Uh, there's a, a ton others now that were acquiring millions of customers, billions of dollars in revenue, and they were doing it all through customer, customer sharing. In other words, they weren't running, they had no stores. They were just doing it through customer referral, typically through give, get models. Like they would have a thing where you could like share a code and give someone a discount, and then you get a discount on your next purchase. And I just remember thinking to myself, I'm like, man, what if you had a million network marketers? <laughs> you know, like, like, you know how passionate networkers are. We're like some of the most passionate, entrepreneurial driven people on the planet. It's like, man, what if you had a million of us that were armed with a, a discount code, but instead of sending them to an MLM website or a network marketing website where they go there and it's like, talks about the opportunity and talks about the car program and talks about all the money they could make. It just, they go there and shop the way that they're used to shopping everywhere else on, online. And they could have a, what we call the pure customer environment where they could actually just be a customer. And then what if your customers could share, you could have customer to customer sharing. And those kind of original, just like these like kind of concepts of like, man, that'd be cool. That turned into like what we thought would be like the, the best business opportunity in all of online e-commerce. And, and the reason why is because you could make money without recruiting. So I'll give you an example. So uh, like I like to say to networkers, show me a way I can make a thousand a month, 10,000 a month or a hundred thousand a month and recruit zero people. And a lot of times they look at you like, wait, what? Like you got to like sell the pack and then do the thing and then get them in the team and left leg, right leg or place them somewhere. And, you know, I remember if we could build a business where people could make $1,000 a month, $10,000 or $100,000 on just our customers, that would be super powerful. And the other question I like to ask networkers is this. If, if no one on your team orders for the next six months, so no one orders, they all stop ordering. How much, what percentage of your income would be residual? And like for the business that I built years ago, if no one on my team ordered, <laughs> like 99% of the income would go away. Like I'd be toast, you know? I mean, I had a few preferred customers, but truthfully, it was just mainly they were basically just all reps, meaning people that had bought to get the discount. And in our business, if, if no one on your team orders for the next six months, you don't order, no one on your team does, you know, 82 to 85% of your revenue would still be there. And the reason why is because it's customer revenue. They're actual customers. They're not, they're, not, they're not going to events. They're not on Super Saturdays. They're not listening to calls. They're not listening to doctors. Like they're just retail customers. And that to me was the power, you know, of the model. And so that's what's happened. You know, we now have uh, for every one person that says yes to our business, 10 say no to our business concept, but say yes to our products. We have a 10 to one ratio of customers, uh, you know, 85%, 82 to 85% of our revenue comes from customer revenue. 33% of our sales each month come from a customer to customer sharing. So in other words, not like, like using MLM terms, our customers are duplicating, <laughs> you know, like they're like sharing our customers are they're not receiving commissions, you know, they're getting free shopping credits. And so that super simple sharing model just really, really took off. And then the last thing I would, I would share is this, this is something that we kind of added on as we went, but I would just say systems. It's one of the reasons I think you and I like, like teleport into each other's brains is because we both like systems. A great systems make great system makes normal people great. And I think in MLM, we all talk about like, do we got a duplicatable system? Like duplication to me in network marketing is like a unicorn. It's like the kind of thing that we all talk about, but no one's ever seen it in real life. You know, it's like, 
we should duplicate over here, you know? And so just, it's just one of those isms, you know, it's something we all just talk about, but no one's ever really seen it. When you have great systems, like we do all the marketing for people so they, they know exactly what to post every single day, what to say, how to say it. And then they have a $10, they have a free app with a discount code. They download the app, they, they post it, they pay twice a day. So it's like they post, they share, they earn. That, that system makes it to where normal people can win. When normal people can win, I mean, you have a business that, you know, really can thrive. And so that, that combination of the model, obviously the products, let me say this about the products. The products to me are obvious. It's like, it's like they're the bedrock of your business. And so people, sometimes people will be like, but our products are amazing. And I'm like, I hope they are. And I assume that they are, but like, it's like Starbucks and Maxwell house can argue who has the best coffee all day long. We have the best coffee beans and we grind them the best and we source them the best and our company culture is the best. But at the end of the day, if you just look at the numbers, like if you were an investor, you would just look at the numbers and you'd be like, I'm going with Starbucks. Like the numbers are just so much more compelling. So like the products are the heartbeat. They're like, the, they're like the reason the business moves, but you have to have the model and everything else because an, a, a great business opportunity, a great business products have to be locked down. You can't sell hype forever or fried froth forever. At some point, you know, the bedrock's going to be the, the products, but it's how are you getting access to the consumer? Like, how are you doing everything else? How simple is it? How simple is the onboarding for a new person? So if all of those things aren't in line, you could literally have the best product on the planet and you're not going to make any money because, you know, no one's going to know about it and you're not going to have access to be able to get access to them. You're not going to be able to talk to them in a way that they're used to. So, you know, the products are the bedrock, but everything else is, the, it's like the, it, it greases the skids to make it really move fast. I want to get back to the products a little bit, but first, you know, I think a lot of people, and I know for me personally, when I first agreed to talk with you, I was like, I just want to learn how this works so that I can make it work here so yeah, I can make it work somewhere else. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of people can go take courses on social selling and, and I think it gets a little bit mixed up with social marketing because it sounds the same. What is it that makes it so doable here, but so hard? Cause I actually was consulting for a company recently to try and help them develop something similar. And I kind of knew from the beginning, like this isn't, I don't, this isn't going to work, you know, but it was an interesting process. What is it that makes it so hard for other companies to just go, okay, we're going to adapt this way of doing things. Yeah. So the, the, one of the gals introduced me to you, uh, was Stephanie Gitt. Stephanie and I were, and her husband and I were friends for, for a couple of years. And she actually like had taken like some online of some of my online courses and I'd even tried to help her. We'd talk on the phone and try and help her, but she like, it, like hit her one day. Like, I can't, <laughs> I can't recreate this. You know, it's the business model is stacked against it. I'll give you guys an example. It, it, you can't get on your Saturday morning team call and say, okay, guys, here's the deal. For now on, we're going to get a lot of customers. Like, let's go. Everyone go get customers. Networkers uh, will find, it's like water. Water will find the course of least resistance. Water doesn't go uphill. It just finds the course of least resistance. Networkers will find the money in the comp plan. Like, they'll figure it out. They'll be like, okay, what you got to do is you got to do this, this, this. They'll figure it out. It's like water. It goes downhill. And so the business model is fundamentally stacked against people winning. So what happens to, you know, us as networkers is, we make it pretty cool. Like we make the model kind of the clunkiness of the model cool, but the clunkiness is still there and it's there for a consumer. Like, you know, the multiple clicks to check out is there. Like you have to have a rep to check out all that stuff. That's all there. And it's just clunky for an end of the line consumer. It's just weird. Um, even, I'll just give you a, just a quick example, even like a wholesale retail price. That's weird for, for most consumers. When they go to Nordstrom's, they just pay the price, you know? And so all of the, like these, these kind of these components of, of traditional network marketing that seems, they seem subtle. They seem like they're not that big of a deal. They're all friction. <laughs> you know, they all create friction. So when you can remove those, there's just, it just is fast, you know, it just goes, goes really smooth. And I want to point this out because this is just to be like in the spirit of being totally fair. There was times when we were trying to create all this stuff, it was almost like trying to create a better higher, but it, a better shape than a circle. You're like, look, they've tried different shapes. They tried a triangle, a square. I don't know what to tell you. The circle is the best they come up with. Like, it's almost like if you're going to do direct sales, you just got to, got to do the model. Like it just is what it is. And I just had no interest in doing the old model anymore. I just didn't want to do it. People say to me sometimes like, well, isn't social retail just the same as direct you know, network marketing or MLM or direct sales or whatever you want to call it, social shit selling. 
Like you're just using a new name. No, that'd be like saying, is an iPad the same as an iPhone? It's like, if you didn't know what an iPad was and someone's trying to explain it to you, they'd be like, well, it's kind of like an iPhone. You'd be like, oh, so it's an iPhone. No, it's not an iPhone. It's kind of like, a, it's bigger. It's like, like, like an iMac, like a laptop. No, it's smaller. You'd have to explain this new thing. And when Apple launched the iPad, they didn't just launch a new product. They launched an entirely new industry. It was called the tablet industry. Now there's other companies that have tablets, right? So like social retail is not just a better MLM version. It's a new, it's a new concept. It's like a new marketing method. And it, it takes the best of the social, social shopping world, the Zulilies and the gilts and so on. It takes the best of direct sales and it like combines those together to create something new. Just like an iPhone would be a kind of a mix of a, of an I, or I'm so sorry, an iPad would be a mix of an iPhone and a, and a laptop. So th there's just components that make it to where it, it, the results kind of speak for themselves as far as the speed, the simplicity, the duplication, where you're not business is hard enough. This is what I like to tell people. Business is hard enough all by itself. If you're going to get in the river of business, it's hard, dude. The river's cold. It moves fast sometimes. It's kind of, it's just hard. It's like, it's easier to like go be an employee somewhere and just sit in your cubicle, just punch out the stuff and just get it done. Business is hard. However, if you're going to be in the river of business, you want to swim downstream. <laughs> you don't want to swim against all the currents. You know, you want to swim upstream. And the doability factor, the doability. So doability would mean one year in this company, one year in this company, five years in this direct sales company, five years in this one, 10 years, 10 years. We think that because they, they all kind of sound the same. They also have a great company, great products, great founder, great compensation plan, great system, you know, like great culture. Like they, we all sort of say the same stuff. The doability is dramatically different. So one year, one year, five years, five years is like completely different results. And that's, that's, I think the difference of the proof of the model is that the, it just, it allows more people to succeed, more people to win. And I think that's the, that's the power of social retail. Okay. So it's funny when you bring up Stephanie, I know that she kind of had the same experience that I did. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be great. Um, I know that my feeling, and I've said this a number of times was like, I wanted to, I wanted to take what I could learn and try and make it work somewhere else. And then all of a sudden it mm -hmm. dawned on me, like I'm dragging a dead horse. I'm just like dragging this horse. And then I spoke with you. I learned more. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is my horse. Like <laughs> this horse is fully stocked. Yeah. So I think but you're saying that, yeah, just that, that you were thinking of, uh, of getting, of, of trying to implement it in your current business. Right. And so, you know, it was all here. It was things that I had dreamed about, honestly. And, um, what, when you say the doability, seeing people who had been those people who were doing the things who I was like, yeah, just, you know, do one more party or, you know, try and see if they want to do the business, see them come here and do things that they honestly didn't believe possible really ever. They didn't believe it coming here that it could be possible. So when you talk about the doability and for the average person to get to come here, that, that is no joke. I've seen it firsthand and we see it all the time. Do you think that, you know, I know that I kind of heard about people coming up. I had done, I had been very successful prior it was kind of like a ceiling, like there was a lid and I was just going to bounce up against it kind of forever. How often do you see people come and actually create something much bigger than they thought possible or was possible for them before? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen someone, someone not do it that, that put in the effort, right? Uh, there's always the disclaimer that, you know, it's like, if you go do nothing here and nothing there, you're probably going to get nothing. Like, I think that's, that's fair. But people that, that, uh, you know, came to, particularly in these last number of years, those first, those first maybe four years was, was, that was kind of a grind. We were trying to figure it out, but these last number of years, when people came, you know, we, we could, the model was, was kind of honed down, the systems worked and we kind of knew what to do. And so with the exception of maybe those first couple of years where we were trying to figure everything out still, maybe, maybe I'd say it then, but you know, here's what I would share. It's like, so first of all, life happens in seasons. You know, there's seasons to your life. And so a lot of times I think we become very like, I'm in this company, so I'll be in this company forever. And by the way, if, if that's working for you, that's great. But let's say it's not working for you. Like, let's say you're not hitting your goals. You're not hitting your dreams. Your team's not hitting their goals, not hitting their dreams. And you don't really see any runway at the end of the, 
at the end of the day that it's going to change, you know, meaning the companies, it's just not, you're not loving the direction. Then you come to this question of like, man, what should I do? Do I just keep like, <laughs> just keep like beat my head against the wall or do I make a change or like, I, I want to be loyal. You know, we kind of go through all these different questions in our minds. Right. And you know, one of the things I would say is this is we all say, it's like, it's not about the money. It's about my team. you know, it's about the culture. Okay. If the company called and said, all right, we have an emergency conference call tonight at six o'clock and, you know, make sure you're on. So you get on and get your whole team on. And then they say, okay, so here's the deal. We're going to make one small change in the business. Everything's going to stay the same. We're still going to do conventions, ship products, give you like pins that you can wear, like recognition pins. We're going to do the weekly memo. We're going to do Zooms, conference calls. We're going to do Super Saturday. Everything's going to stay the same, everything. And you're okay, well, so what's the one change? Oh, yeah, there's one change. So one small change. We're just not going to pay anybody anymore. Well, how many of us would continue to do it? Well, 0% of us. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's all about the money. And you say, no, it's not all about the money for me. No, it is all about the money because if they stop, if they took that one thing away, then you would stop doing it. So, it, you know, that matters, right? And so I think, I think as you say to people, if you were a real estate bro you know, agent and at brokerage A, you made $100,000 and at brokerage B, you'd make $500,000. i am using these numbers just arbitrary. This is not a guarantee of income. I'm just using this to make the, make the point. Would you transfer to brokerage B, you can make five times the money with the same amount of effort. Like, well, if you had half a brain, of course you would. You say, but I love brokerage A. You'll love brokerage B five times more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, right. you're, you're succeeding at a higher level. And so the model does matter. Like, you know, business is not, we all sort of sound the same, but they're not all the same. It's the same thing with Tesla and Ford. Like, you know, te Ford made fun of Tesla for years. Like, who are these EV startups? And then Tesla went out and literally buried those guys. Like they, now Tesla's down now and they're still way bigger than Ford. Yeah. And so the, the doability matters, the season of your life, you know, the average CEO is in a, a CEO for four years. You know, if you've been in one company in direct sales, by the way, my very first company, I never thought I'd leave. I'm like, dude, I'm so loyal. Now, listen, I think you should be loyal in your marriages, like have fidelity in your marriages. Like I think you should be loyal. There's areas in your life, your friendships and so on in business. There's other components. My very first company, I was like, I would never leave. Well, dude, the business left me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it, and I look back now, it was like one door closed, a bigger door opened. It was honestly a blessing looking back because that was just that business never really had the legs and needed to become a great, great business. It never, it never would have gotten there, never. And so I think getting really kind of objective and real with yourself of like, here's one of the questions. Do you see yourself doing this in five years? I said to people, if you're not going to do this for five more, five years, you shouldn't do it for five more minutes because life's too fast. Like life, life, life is moves too fast and it's too short. You want to do things that where it makes your heart sing, put, you know, it really gets you excited where you can really go, you know, maximize your, your income earning potential and really go grow into the person you're trying to grow. Because at the end of the day, yes, we love the products. And again, if you love the products, keep using them forever. But at the end of the day, we're trying to make a living for our families at the end of the day, because if they took that one component away, we wouldn't keep doing it. And so, I think that's one of the things we have to look at is, is we're looking at this profession is the profession moves. Now, I don't think you should jump around every five minutes, every six months. I think that's like the worst, worst way to do direct sales. Find a great company, find great systems, find great people you want to do life with, great mentorship, and then hunker down and make it work. But if, if the tide is completely going the wrong direction, meaning you, you, you know that this isn't going to change, then maybe that's when you start to say, all right, how do we, how do we play our cards appropriately here? I think one of the most like devastating things for me is seeing leaders who are so wonderful. You know, they've worked so hard, they've built something and they see it kind of going in the wrong direction. But the thought of having to do this all over again, the thought of leaving the community, the thought of making a different decision and but really just because that struggle is so great for that long, you know, it's been all they've known for so long the idea of doing something new is paralyzing and scary. And so what, what do you say to leaders who are in that position? You know, when I look at it, I'm like, you've, you've done incredible. Like you are successful. You can continue to be successful. I hear a lot of times, and I know I was kind of in that place where it was like, I guess this is over. I guess we're just done here. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, the bird doesn't trust the branch. The bird trusts the wings. <laughs> So you're kind of like, 
Like I'm going to go recreate this thing. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go do it bigger and better. The other thing I'd share is a lot of people are like, I just cannot imagine doing this again. Like just, just the idea of grinding it out and, you know, homes and so on. Listen, there's better ways to do this whole thing. You can, like, it can go faster. Like, I, like sometimes when I think of the old way that I used to do it, let's call it 12 years ago. I honestly don't want to do that again either. So I'm with you. Like I, I feel you. There's just a better way to do. There's a better way to build teams and there's a better way to, you know, to, to acquire customers. There's just a better model. It's a better way to do it. It's like, you know, it's again, the Netflix blockbuster concept. It's like, there's just a better model, a better way to do this whole thing. So that'd be my first thing. Second thing is this. People ask me sometimes, like, do I really want to be authentic? I'm an authentic person. What do I authentically tell my team? I go, what you should authentically tell your, the way to be authentic with your team is to be authentic. Just tell them the truth. Say, listen, guys, I gave this everything, everything I had. I said, don't talk anything negative about the prior business. You wouldn't be who you are without it. Through the goods and the bads, ups and downs, it's all good. Just say, listen, I had a great experience there, but you know, I'm at a season where I, I know I need to make a make a transition. Like, that's just the honest answer. You know, it's just the truthful, honest answer. And do it with courage and go for it. You know, go go pursue your dreams and goals. There's nothing worse. You know, you don't want to die with all your music still in you. You know, there's nothing worse than like having a book to write you never wrote, a song to sing you never sung, like a business to build you never built just because you were like so fearful. Like it's just, that's the worst way to live your life. You've got to go for it. Go for your, go for your goals, go for your dreams. If that's where you're at, then go hunker down and go make it happen. If it's not, then make your transition and go to work, you know, go launch. If you look at like a case, I could give you seriously a case study of a hundred networkers. I could give you a case study of 500 networkers probably, but if you look at the biggest networkers in the world, it's the, the, the exception is it's their first company. The rule is it's their second or third company. Because in the first company, you learn a lot. You learn, you grow, you adapt, you understand compensation, culture, systems, you understand stuff. The second or third company is typically where people get, that's where they really succeed because they've learned. By the way, same thing's true in employment, just a normal job too. And so you kind of learn in the first job, maybe learn some stuff in the second job. The third one's where you really, you know, you really came in. Maybe you got equity in the company. Maybe you were kind of a higher level position, maybe an executive, maybe a, a vice president, because you you proved yourself in those prior businesses. Same thing kind of happens in, in networking where you're like, you're not coming to the to the party as a beginner, you're coming as a as a pro. I tell people, you know, amateurs launch or amateurs join professionals launch. So you get into a launch mode, you go launch a multi-million dollar business versus join the company. A lot of us joined nine years ago when we first started. We just joined the company, like the products, like the people. Next thing you know, we turn into a leader. Now you're a pro. <laughs> now you get to go launch a multi-million dollar business and do it on purpose and by design. And so that's kind of what I would say. The main thing is life is short. You know, Marcus Aurelius was the famous uh, 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 Roman emperor. He was the fifth and last great Roman emperor. This really interesting guy had all the power in the world, could could have anyone murdered he wanted, could have any woman he wanted, could have any food he wanted. He was just this, had all the power literally in the world. But yet he was this really righteous, introspective guy. And he wrote what he called his meditations. He didn't think anyone was ever going to read them, but the, there's a book now called Meditations. Go read his, his, his writings. Anyway, he had a, a coin that he would carry in his pocket called Memento Mori. Memento Mori means meditate on mortality. It basically means remember you're going to die, <laughs> you know? He said, you could leave life right now, let it determine what you do, say, and think. And so if your heart's not on fire right now and you don't see any like sign that's ever going to switch around, that's when you say, I'm, I got to live a life, you know, memento mori. Like I, like I got to meditate that this thing's not going to last forever and I've got to go make it happen because people are, you know, counting on you to serve at a high level and to kind of let your wings, you know, fully open and go for it. So that I look back at those businesses. The first one went out of business, so I had no choice. The second one, the selling that business was probably the very best business decision I'd ever made in my whole career. And I made some good ones. That was probably the best one. And the reason I say that is because it was so hard to make. It was so hard to make. I was like, I was the keynote speaker at a convention. I was traveling around the world. I was like, like every weekend I was speaking. I was just like the guy. It was so hard to make. I didn't want to hurt anyone else's dreams, anyone else's goals. I didn't want to, you know, funk with their belief. But I, I look back now. And it would, it just was not the right fit. My heart was not turned on anymore. And the thing about me, one of the strengths I feel like I have is people may not believe what I say, but they know that I believe what I say, <laughs> you know? And, and so when I lost that ability to believe in what I was saying, uh, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't sing that song. You know, I had, I had to switch, switch gears. Yeah, I can relate to that for sure. You, I think that one of the most incredible things that, I've noticed since getting to work with you is 
you're not just training on how to sell things or how to bring people in. Um, you have incredible trainings that you just finished. A, did you, you had a conference right in Southern California yeah. that was for anybody, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's just a leadership event. So we had, we had people from, you know, oil and gas, mortgages, real estate, obviously direct sales. We had, um, uh, we had people, you know, just across spectrums, employees, 1099, business owners, et cetera, that were at that event. It was, it was a great, a great event. That's amazing. I know. I wish I'd been there. If I was down South. I would have, I would have snuck in. What's amazing is that in the events that we've done, you've held some awesome events that I've gotten to be a part of. We're, I mean, we talk about this business as an asset and I don't think that that is really spoken about in a lot of companies because you just really have to just focus on what it is and do the things. And there's no like looking around ever. And that was really what my big goal was, was to be able to have a podcast, be myself, write, um, expand. And I wouldn't have at the time said like, I want my business to be an asset, but can you speak to just what that's like? Because I see it across the company and in leadership. And it gets to be a conversation that I have where I'm like, Hey, what's your actual dream? Like, what is it that gives you purpose? And you know, it, you don't have to say collagen. Yeah. So first of all, so Robert Schuler was a famous religious author. And he said, if you build the people, the people will build the church. And the concept is if you build the people, the people will build the family. If you build the people, the people will build the, the, the community, the church, the government, the schools, the PTA, the football team, it's about people building. So I feel like I'm in the people building business. I help to build people and building people is not just like helping them to make money selling products, building people is their, their courage, their confidence, their competency, meaning their ability to have high skills, uh, the clarity they have in the business, knowing what they want in their life, how to go, how to go chase it down, building their character, you know, where they're high character people, because that kind of stuff, it affects every area of their life. Like if I can help a, a woman with her confidence, that's going to affect all the areas of her life and, and therefore kids' life, husband's life. If I can affect a man's character, that's going to affect every area of his life, in his career, in his marriage, in his faith, and all those key areas. And so I, I just believe if you want to pull the best out of people, one of the biggest mistakes we make is this. People say, how do I motivate my team? I said, how is the wrong question? It's not a how question. It's a what question. The what question is what already motivates you. The secret to motivation is finding out what already motivates someone and help them, helping them to get it. What already motivates you? What are some of your goals? What are you looking to achieve? What does success look like for you? What do you want out of life? Like figuring that stuff out and then finding ways to help them to get it. In this case, using your business as a vehicle, you can help them to get those things. But like, I see sometimes people, you know, I see different leaders. I even see companies that someone's like wants to do a podcast or wants to, you know, whatever, build their personal brand. And they feel, they feel like it's going to distract them from the business or it's going to, they, they try and clip the wings, you know, keep them as small as possible. I, I want our teams to be as big as possible. I want them to shine as bright as they possibly can. Like, I feel like the more I can help them to shine as bright as they possibly can in all their areas of life in building their assets, you know, their investments and building their, uh, you know, a podcast or a personal brand. Like I want them to get as big as possible because I feel like it's it, the, the bigger they get, the more influence they have to, to, to serve at a high level in their business. Now, do I believe in focus? Listen, I could literally give a weekend seminar on just the word focus easy, you know, you go be for there. Three or four days <laughs> how to get, you know, laser focus. So I'm all about focus. I think that you can chase too many things and, and never get anything done. I'm all about that. But the ultimate focus should be on your, on, on who you are. Like, what is your purpose? What is your calling? What is, what is your heart? What turns your heart on? And when, when your heart's on fire, then we can like direct it into all the things that actually drive revenue. You know, one of the things I teach is a, a three-step wealth building strategy that I learned from a, a billionaire mentor of mine. Uh, he was actually uh, one of the top networkers in the world. So 17 years ago, when I first joined, I literally asked, I said, who's the best in the world to this, you know? And, and they, I was introduced to him. And from for, the, for about the next probably 12 years, he was a mentor from afar. And in the last number of years, we, he's been a mentor up close. We've done investments together. He's been a personal mentor. He tragically died on uh, January 2nd. He's a, he owned his own jet and he was a pilot and he, he, the, they, the jet crashed. And so, um, by the way, Memento Mori, my friends, you got to go for this stuff. Like life, life doesn't last forever. This guy was like immortal and he, he, and he passed, you know? And so 
I share that with you to say he was a billionaire mentor of mine that taught me this super simple three-step wealth building strategy. Step one is maximize your income. In other words, you've got to learn how to make as much as you can. And so one of the things I try and do is help people to maximize their income. So in your case, if, if your podcast builds your reach, I want you to maximize all of this stuff. So you build all of it because all of it will ultimately serve the, the things that are going to help you to maximize your income, which is our you know, goal one of, of wealth building and wealth creation. This guy made over $70 million in his network marketing business, which is incredible. But what's really incredible is he turned the 70 million into a billion. Mm. That's pretty incredible. And so that's, that's what I like to teach people how to do. And so meaning to, to those three steps, right? Maximize your income, minimize your expenses, and then build cash flowing assets. And so, I don't know. I feel like that that's, that's the way you build true loyalty is when you're really focused on someone's real dreams, real goals, you're honest with them and the company's goals or my goals specifically, my goals are all secondary to their goals, like their dreams. Cause if I can help them get what they want, I'll get, I'll get what I want as, you know, as a byproduct. Yeah, there's no question that the leadership here is really second to none. And I know that um, there was a point where I all of a sudden it, it just hit me like, well, I'm not the smartest person in this room. <laughs> I have a lot to learn. And it felt amazing. You know, like, I don't know that you can really describe that. And then getting to learn from you sitting down and having, you know, a conversation on financial decisions and investing, you know, that was it. It's it just shows the kind of the level of where we're at and where we're going. I would love though to talk about these products for a minute. Um, and that's not really what this podcast is about necessarily, but I, I still cannot grasp why we get to have the, the level of products that we do, um, especially with what's coming out and the impact it's going to have. I don't think that there's really anyone, not even outside of network marketing, who has kind of this level of scientist, you know, scientists, science, clinical proof and efficacy that that is in this company. And so like, why? Why us? And <laughs> how do we keep going with this? You know, how, how is it that we get to have such incredible, meaningful products? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. So I was part of this transformation team, right? So the company had had eight years of declining revenue. They're kind of going the wrong direction. And I remember they gave me a box of their products. This was, in essence, the prior company because we, we basically tore it down to the floorboards and rebuilt. But this is the prior business. And at this point, I have no emotional connection to this at all. I'm brand new. I'm a consultant. If you've ever done consulting work, like you care, obviously, but it's not like it's your baby, right? Like it's just their, it's their thing. So give me this box of products. I remember I gave it to my wife. I was just like, honey, here's, here's a big, huge box of products. And um, I remember a couple of days into it or a week or so into it, I said to her, I go, how do you like the products? And she's like, those products are really, really, really good. <laughs> She, I'm like, are you serious? And she wouldn't tell me this if she didn't mean it. You know, she goes, they're really high quality. They're really good. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I remember one day I woke up, this is when we were doing the, the transformation and I was like kind of late to get to the office. And I like jumped in the shower and got ready and went real fast threw a load of laundry and threw some dish, you know, dishwasher uh, dish in the dishwasher. Anyway, I, I like, I was like driving. I was like, wait a second. I just used, and I was like counting it up. I just used 22 different products this morning, like on the way out, you know, protein shake, multivitamin, the whole thing. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, man, that is pretty powerful. 25 years, years into this, if, if I had a team of a million people doing what I just did today, that's 22 different products in multiple areas of their home, multiple uh, kind of product categories of their home that they would be consuming. I was like, that is really a powerful thing. And so the proof's a little bit in the pudding, meaning you can only go on hype for so long. You can only go on anticipation for so long or excitement for so long. At some point, you have to have products that an end of the line consumer really wants and is going to continue to consume. So before I showed up, they had, they had uh, sold over 6.7 billion worth of product sales before I even you know showed up to the party. And I share that with you to say, even through all of the, the ups and the downs and the, some of the, 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 the craziness that the prior business went through, people still love the products. They couldn't, you know, it's like you couldn't kill the machine because the people just love the products. So that's the one thing. And then since I've been here, we've sold 2.4 billion. We've had two different billion dollar product lines and a billion dollar product line you know, how many, how many people do you know that have like from their kitchen tables sketched out some ingredients and said, here's an idea. And then like went out and sourced them around the world and then launched a product that became a billion dollar product. Like it's, it's pretty rare. How many people do you know that have done it twice? It's just really, really rare. And in our space, you know, that's typically it's about half a billion in commissions per one of those. Right. So it's a, it's a unique product. 
what we're doing next in this women's health space, I think it, it, I think it has the same potential to be the next billion. What's interesting though on this one is the the way it galvanizes people. The way it, I've never seen anything quite like it. The, the movement it causes, the 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 uh, visceral response that the conversation of helping normalize the idea of helping people through their 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 women's health, right, and through the experiences they're having. And so if this becomes another billion dollar product over the next three to five years, that product alone, in addition to all the other products, but that one alone will pay out approximately half a billion in commissions and trips and rewards and so on. And so they just don't come <laughs> along very often where you have multiple billion dollar products and you just are good at just launching the next one and then the next one and then the next one. And so from an opportunity perspective, that is the game. Apple doesn't sell you iPod one anymore or iPhone one anymore. They, they continue to innovate and stay innovative. And I think that's really the, what we've done well is just continue to stay relevant, and innovative. Yeah, well, my personal results, I will not talk about right now, but I can say that I'm floored by the women's health product, like completely floored. And it wasn't that I was skeptical, but I have a lot of things that need fixing. And so getting to access this and getting to share it is, is thrilling, honestly. I could really sit here and ask you a million more questions, but I've taken up enough of your time. I thank you so, so much. Thank you for helping to develop this incredible system. I do think that it's going to change. It's going to change an industry. You know, I see it happening already, but it uh, gives me a lot of pride to get to be a part of this and get to work with you. Your leadership is like none other. I've, I've worked with lots of leaders and I've never had someone as active in training leaders and working with team and providing things for a team as you. And it speaks volumes because you're definitely the most successful and busiest and, you know, most out there person that I've gotten to work with as far as leaders go. And it's just, it's really incredible. Hey, I want, okay. I have one question. The story about the, the taxi driver. Yeah. The, the, the Uber story. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, pre-COVID, I travel even more than I do now. And we live in a place called Southern Utah, which is like in the Red Rocks of Southern Utah. We used to live up in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City in the winter gets really cold, lots of snow, lots of ice, really dark. And um, I was I had an early morning flight. I've been traveling that week. I was home for a couple of days, had an early morning flight, wake up at like 4.30 in the morning. And at 5, I call for this Uber. And Long story short, the guy pulls up. I have a hoodie on. I got my, I got my jacket on. Like I'm like, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I'm super. I was not being a good networker in any way. I was just tired and I had a headache and I just didn't want to travel. And I wheel my luggage down the icy steps. He opens up the trunk. I put my luggage in. I, I get in the car and I, I think to myself, I'm either going to just take a, like a kind of a power nap on the drive to the airport or maybe do some work on my phone. But out of respect for the guy, I said, I said, I said, good morning. How are you? And he said, in this really, in really enthusiastic, high pitched voice, he goes, "If I was any better, my name would be Justin." I was like, "Okay, you know, what's up?" I was like, "I wasn't expecting that. I'm all about enthusiasm." I was like, "Dang, dude, that's early. Like, what's up?" And then I go, uh, "What got you driving for Uber? You know, how long have you been doing this?" And he said, "He said my cats, they don't meow, they roar." And he said, "At five in the morning, they start roaring." And so he said, "I figure I got to wake up and feed the cats, and I don't have work till eight thirty, so I might as well drop for Uber." <laughs> it's like, dude, what is happening with this guy? You know, I said, well, what do you do for work at 830? And he is the co-founder of an $87 million tech company, a place called Provo, Utah. So this guy is a multi, 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 multi millionaire whose cats don't meow. <laughs> they roar. So he wakes up and drives for Uber. And it just is a great reminder, my friends, that you sometimes you don't recognize the greatness of the person sitting next to you. Like sometimes you don't recognize that they're the one for their family. They're the one that changes everything for their family. And I'd like to remind people, like, you're the one, you know, you're the one for your family. You're the one. You're the one that generations of people have lived and bled and died for, that they crossed oceans for. Like, they came all across the world to create you and for you to have this moment. You're the one that future generations of kids that are yet unborn will look up into that family lineage and say, it was her. You know, it was him. He's the one. He's the one that changed our family's life forever. And so you're the, my challenge to you or my invitation to you as we leave our conversation is to go be the one, be the one today that lives a life, be the one today that writes a story that future generations of kids that are yet unborn know your story. They know who you are because you mattered and you made things happen. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. I love that story. Um, and that is everything. Be the one. You can absolutely be the one. And that's exactly what this podcast is about. And I just appreciate you again so much. And 
if you are not following Justin, please go Instagram, YouTube. He's going to inspire you on all levels, no matter where it is that you're going in life right now. And I just so appreciate you guys for being here, meeting my friend. And Justin, I will see you in just a few short weeks. I can't wait.